night was so dark, I felt in my heart my song had come to an end. My spirit was willing, but my body was weak. I thought this is a way to put it in. Then Jesus came like a thief in the night. Touched me and I was made whole. My song did not end, it started over again. And I want everybody to know the story about my healing. Oh, healing. The great physician. Minister healing to my soul. The ills of my body were healed by the stripes on his back. The great physician ministered healing to my soul. My body was weak, my spirit was low, it seemed I died a little each day. My friends tried to help, they tried to cheer me up, but there was nothing for them to say. Then Jesus came like a thief in the night. Touched me and I was made whole. The doctors were stunned, they had nothing to say, but there was something they had to know. I just told them about my feeling. Oh, he, he. The great physician ministered healing to my soul. The ills of my body were healed by the stripes on his back. The great physician ministered healing to my soul. shadow of death you think that your time is at hand listen to this don't think for a moment he's forgotten your name at the crossing of Jordan to healing begins the hills of my body by the strength of his The great position minister healing to my soul. The great position minister healing to my soul.
Therefore, it wasn't chronology or linear time understanding, but it was theology. It was our thoughts of God, who He is, and what He means to us. John wrote to help us understand that Jesus is the Lord. Now, the way he does that in this incident is to tell or retell the conflict that Jesus had with religious leaders over their rituals and their traditions. Jesus had healed a man on the Sabbath day, and the traditionalists did not like the change. How many of you like change? You see your hands. You really like change a whole lot. Yeah, all right, we got one. All the rest of you liars go back to sleep. No. Uh, actually, I, I think it was Mark Twain who once said that the only one who really likes change is a wet baby. Um, and I think that's true. Let's, let's take a look at this man who was in sad shape before he met Jesus. But I want to do a little bit of uh, uh, setting up here before we investigate. Because the sermon is kind of short. And it's going to lead into our time of healing prayer. Um, and I've got a few things to say about that. I want to get to it in just a moment. Uh, but when you are invited at the end of this time to come to be prayed for, uh, there are some, uh, just some housekeeping details. Number one, we do use oil to anoint. We make the sign of the cross on the forehead. If for some reason that would irritate your skin or <coughs> you don't care to have that, uh, all you have to do when you come is say just the prayer and we will bypass the all. The, the point is simply this, your coming is the step of faith. We use the oil as a symbol of God's healing power. Uh, in ancient times and even today to some extent, oil is used in the process of healing, skin irritations and so on. It, is a, it has a very soothing effect. Oil is a good thing and occupies a very high place in scripture and in the book of James, it tells us that when we, uh, when we call for the elders to pray for us for healing, that the elders to anoint us with oil and the effectual fervent prayer of righteous man availeth much. We know that these, uh, uh, these times can be very, very meaningful. And so uh, you don't have to come. Nobody's going to pick you up by the arm and carry you here. This is entirely voluntary. Uh, but it is a time of healing prayer that will end our service today, and I just wanted to make you aware of that. Let's take a look at this guy who was in really sad shape before the Lord touched him. And uh, what changes occurred when Jesus touched this man? He touched him in three ways, and the first of these is Jesus touched his will. His will. His will is the, the, will is the uh, innermost decision-making part of who we are. It's that intellectual but also emotionally timed um, indicator inside of us about what we will and what we won't do. I will do this. I won't do that. Uh, for 38 years, this man, in his illness and the way that people treated him because of his illness, he had been kept in something of a societal bondage. He was a prisoner of sorts, but he believed that God was on a first come, first served accessibility. If you listen to the story carefully, it talked about when the water in the pool was troubled. And it was the ancient belief that at the pool of Bethesda, at the temple, uh, the, the, the gate where, uh, where people would come in and go out, that pool would suddenly ripple from time to time, and it was the ancient belief that it was rippling because of an angel who was touching the water, an angel that was entering the water. And the ancient belief, the tradition was that whoever got in there first, that was the person who was going to be healed. And so the man was laying there for 38 years knowing he needed healing. His legs were totally useless. And knowing he needed healing, but each time the water was troubled, each time there was rippling going on, signifying that healing was available to the first one in the water, somebody else would be into it. And he remained on that pallet for 38 years. Is that a long time to be sick? You know, we worry about a cold that lingers on for two, three weeks. And this man was lying on a pallet, unable to move, dependent upon everybody else. This man had 
the perfect excuse for never getting better. He was the poster boy for I'm a victim. Look at my circumstance. I can't move. Everybody else is winning. I always lose. And Jesus confronted the man. He said simply, do you want to get better? Very often we just, you know, we, we kind of gloss over that one word, want. You really want to get better. The man played out his well-rehearsed line. Hey man, smell the coffee here. Everybody else is faster than me. I can't get down there to get that healing. Of course, I want to be better. Well, Jesus' answer was why? Well then, yeah. Pick up your pallet. Pick up that mat and go. Rise, walk. There was no pitying. There was no patronizing. Jesus told the man, get your stuff together, get up and walk. Strange thing is that the man did. Now, um, you and I are somewhat like that. I think we're subject to the same kind of temptation to sit back in our infirmity and not stand up when God promises healing. And it comes in all different varieties. There's physical, but there's also spiritual and mental. There is emotional. There is situational. I mean, we, you can apply a whole bunch of names to any of this. But Jesus touched this man with a face-to-face -face confrontation. And it isn't the same way with all of us. I mean, very few of us have seen Jesus face-to-face -face here, right? Uh, some We call that a very strange occurrence. And Jesus comes to us in different ways. Sometimes Jesus comes to us in the memory of a fine Christian who overcame a lot of adversity and worked uh, as an example, working hard, loving others, and engaging people, engaging life with an enthusiasm. Sometimes the touch is your dad's words that linger hanging in your ears long after your father's gone. Sometimes it's the Bible. The Bible is a touch of Jesus. What does the scripture say about itself? That it is like a sharp sword, two-edged, cutting back and forth, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it knows your heart. It will prick your heart, your conscience. The Bible is a touch of Jesus. Sometimes the touch of Jesus might be a kindness extended to you from a friend, or maybe even from a foe. The touch of Jesus might be a child's admiration that you just don't want to destroy. I want you to know that for me, every one of those six examples that I just gave you is true. I have been encouraged by the memory of fine Christian leaders who were just so much uh, wonderful examples for me that uh, I want to emulate them. I've been touched by my father's words. He's been with the Lord now for over four years. And I, you know, I still hear his words ringing in my ears. And I want to emulate him. The Bible continues to touch me day by day by day. Kindness extended to me by friends and foe alike. The touch of Jesus in a child's admiration when they look up to you with some kind of hero worship and they, they talk about wanting to be like you. You know, you don't want to destroy that kind of spirit in a child, do you? And so you press on. Those are inspirational points. Jesus touched this man's will in a way that was right for him. It was exactly what he needed. Jesus confronted him, asking him if he wanted. Is your will the same as the Father's will for you? What is the Father's will according to James? that you may be well and in peace. Jesus not only touched the man's will, he touched his witness. And it's a certainty, certainty that this man uh, was uh, a walking, talking billboard for Jesus. I mean, there he was, 38 years of an impotent life, no power whatsoever. Jesus touched him and suddenly he had a life. And even when he was questioned by the the town politis, political religious leaders, the movers and shakers, his witness became unshakable. Here's a question before the house this morning. What is it that could take a weak and hopeless invalid and make him into a fearless, tireless witness for Christ? Perhaps the answer is in the name of the place where he got healed, Bethesda. In, in uh, Hebrew, the word is chesed. And literally it means house of grace or house of mercy. Chesed is the covenant mercy of God. 
And I think that all of us could do much more with our witness for Christ if we were to remember the mercy and the grace that caused Christ to come to us in the first place. This man received his healing and it so changed his life that he couldn't stop talking about Jesus. Even when Jesus told him, now listen, you hush, don't, don't sin anymore, don't tell anybody. What did the man do? As soon as he realized that it was Jesus that had healed him, he went back and he told the religious leaders, because that was their question, he was going to say, it was Jesus that healed me. I mean, so often, so often, our witness would be much stronger if we would remember the grace that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the love that brought it down to man. Jesus touched the man's will, touched the man's uh, witness, and he touched the man's weakness. The physical is a very important part of this. The Bible tells us this man was healed, and the verb root there is enlarged. The man was enlarged. Heretofore, he even had a low profile. What is it like to lay down? You're below everybody else, aren't you? Now he's standing, he's walking, where he was never doing any of that before. This man was enlarged. That's what healing is. The man became normal, he became changing, he became growing, and it put him right in the middle of the controversy between Jesus and the religious leaders. Henry Blackaby wrote this about the syndrome of weakness when it comes to being healed. Whether we really want to or not, this is what he said. Many people have grown up attending church and hearing about God all their lives, but they do not have a personal, dynamic, growing relationship with God. Henry Blackaby made me say ouch over that. Our generation has taken a lot of the activities that the Bible identifies as sin and labeled them as victim stuff, addiction, disease, character flaw, an abusive upbringing. I was dropped on my head as a child, and so that's why I do the things I do. And we act as if having an addiction Having a circumstance, having an adversity is some kind of sufficient excuse for disobeying God's commands. I was born this way and it makes me want to do that a lot more than you want to do that. And so even though God says don't do that, I am going to do that. As Christians, though, the Bible tells us that we are no longer victims of our sin. We are not helpless. The Bible tells us that we are overcomers. The Bible tells us that victimhood is not ours. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, is what we say. There's no sinful habit, there's no past hurt that's beyond the healing touch of our Lord. So the question then becomes, have we gone year after year after year without receiving spiritual healing? I'm here to tell you this morning that God is capable of freeing you. The question for you and for me is have we become comfortable in our sin of not being obedient to God? See, if you really want spiritual health, God can give it today. And that spiritual health, health tends in all of these areas our will, do we want to be healed? Our witness? Are we afraid to speak out? Who? Are we afraid if God heals us that we'll have to do something about it? That we'll have to praise Him openly? That we'll have to become one of those people, you know who I'm talking about, the religious fanatics? And it comes in the area of our weakness too. Sometimes our weakness is our friend, isn't it? Sometimes it's something we can cling to and not be required to do very much. How many of you like to pull the blanket back over your head on a Monday morning? <laughs> I saw that, I saw that hand. <laughs> oh man, I'm the first one to raise a hand. You know, Monday after Sunday is, is tough. Most preachers, their wives don't want to know them on, on, on Monday, trust me. All right, even Sunday afternoon sometimes. I get an amen over there. Yeah. The point is, it's so much easier to call in sick, isn't it? 
And that's what this is about. This guy had been calling in sick for 38 years. And Jesus said with one little question, do you want to give that up? That's a choice, isn't it? But the choice is here for us. If you're tired of laying on the sidelines, if you are tired of having what you've always had and you desire a closer walk with him, if you are tired of nothing ever changes, would you really jump at the chance for a new life? Have you been satisfied with limping long enough? You want to be made whole. Here's the issue. If you're truly tired of laying on the sidelines, let Jesus touch your will, your witness, and your weakness, whatever your need is. And when he touches you, like the man at the pool of Bethesda, because of the mercy, the grace, the chesed of God, you will rise up and you'll walk. And the best news is, you will never walk alone. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. <clears throat> We're, as a preparation, we're going to sing the first verse of Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Let's stand together as we sing that verse, and then hold on to your hand a little bit. At the end of this time of healing prayer, we're going to be singing the last verse of it. First verse.
I'll be testing one person and testing the next person. We use sanitation in order not to transmit the germs. I'll be doing that, sanitizing my finger each time, then dipping it in the oil and applying it to your forehead and pray for you. All right. After that, if you care to go to the altar, you can do that or return to your seat. But that's what we do. Here's why we do it. We do it because God is here. God loves us. God wants us to be made whole. You're invited to come as Elizabeth.